I'm Charlotte McLeod with InvestingNews.com, and here today with me is Rick Rule, proprietor at Rule Investment Media. Thank you so much for joining me. Great to have you here. Charlotte, I'm delighted to be back with you. Thanks for having me back. Of course. Always a pleasure to speak with you, and good to be connecting at VRIC. That's where we are today. And I want to start with the title of one of your talks, and I'm going to look at the screen here so I get it right. Exploration is out of favor. I'm moving back into exploration. So I think anyone who's watching will be feeling that sentiment. So is this the bottom for juniors, do you think? I don't know. Okay. But it kind of doesn't matter. Um, Bernard Baruch once said that the only person who absolutely bought at the bottom and sold at the top was a liar. It didn't happen. Could the exploration stocks go lower? Yes. Have I made a lot of money buying at or around market bottoms in the past? Yes. The constant for me, uh, Charlotte, is that these are capital-intensive cyclical businesses. And to really make money, you have to be a contrarian. When exploration is out of favor, I look to it. You'll remember two or three years ago, you and I having discussions about uranium. Deeply out of favor. Deeply hated. Look at what happened. Uh, that's why I'm in the exploration space. Yes, uranium, definitely a really good example. And we're going to come back to that a little further on in the conversation. I wondered if you could get a little bit more specific on how you're getting back into exploration, because I think people would be interested to hear if you're looking at a particular sector or type of company. From my point of view, in the last 10 years, the exploration sector has been overvalued. The prices that people put on equity offerings and the lack of warrants didn't compensate investors for the risk that they were taking in exploration. That's changed. The exploration companies played chicken with capital markets, raising money just in time. They're out of money. They need to come to investors, and the pool of investors is smaller than it used to be. Here I am. Ten years ago, uh, it seemed to me that the best value propositions in natural resources were among the very largest companies, the very safest companies in the space. So I could be in names like Wheaton Precious uh, or Exxon or Franco Nevada. And given that I wasn't paid to take the risk inherent in the exploration companies, I didn't do it. Now we're in a circumstance where some of these companies have done 10 years of good work. They're selling for a third of the price that they were selling for 10 years ago before they did the good work. And there's nobody competing with me on the bid. Uh, this is a wonderful circumstance, particularly, frankly, Charlotte, for a 70-year-old who, who isn't as able to work hard as he was 20 years ago. The fact that the younger, abler competitors of mine are on strike is just the very best possible circumstance for me. Okay. And you said our last conversation was back in November. And as you're saying, you know, you're here, you're looking to allocate capital. But I remember you were having a tough time doing it then. So has, has that changed? Uh, it's changed because companies that were adequately capitalized a year ago, some of them, have run out of money. I mean, run out of money. I'll give you an example. This is not an investment recommendation. Uh, a former market darling, uh, it's called Chicana, C-H-A-K-A-N-A. -A. I think it ran up to probably, I don't know, 80 or 90 cents some years ago. Reasonably successful exploration. So I believe that the market cap was probably justified by mineral inventory uh, in some breccia pipes. Two great, great, great big targets. Uh, the people behind the company I know very well, high quality people. Pre-money market cap, $6 billion. Uh, and they give me a full warrant. So if they have uh, an exploration success, there's a real good chance of a 10-bagger or a 15-bagger with a full warrant. Now, people that play this game need to understand that in exploration the most likely outcome in each investment decision that you make is failure. The most likely outcome is that you lose 20 or 25% before you can liquidate your holdings on a failure. But if the downside is 20 to 30%, but the upside is 1,500% with a warrant, it means that your real upside is 25 to 1. One 25 bagger amortizes a ton of 25% losers. And we're back in the place where the Chicana Copper type of circumstances, six, $6 million backstop pre-money valuations are around. So I'm back to. Okay. So we started with the specific looking at the juniors. Now I want to pull way back out. I think each time we talk, I check in with you on the health of the U.S. economy. And last time you were still pleasantly surprised, but you said cracks were emerging because of high interest rates. So 
looking at 2024, rates seem poised to come down. Mm-hmm. Is that going to ease those cracks or, or? I think the Fed is hoping that they won't need to interest that they, they won't need to interest ease interest rates. I think that the Fed is hoping that they can talk about easing interest rates uh, and have the economy loosen up. But the Fed, we're in front of the Fed starting a new bank, so we talk to them a lot. Uh, the Fed recognizes that there's no fiscal discipline from Congress. And so the only thing that stands behind the U.S. economy and really idiotic inflation is the Fed. The Fed, in the absence of some control of spending by Congress, uh, the only tool that they have to keep the U.S. economy sort of on kilter is interest rates. Their preference would be not to cut uh, and if the U.S. economy continues to show reasonable signs of strength, I think they'll talk about cutting as opposed to cut. If you begin to see more carnage in the economy, then, of course, they'll be forced politically to cut interest rates. Okay, very interesting. Though. So, but that might not happen if they, if they can get away with it. I think their preference in the absence of restraint from Congress, which doesn't seem to be in Congress vocabulary, uh, would be to keep interest rates higher for longer. All right. Okay, very interesting. So I want to I want to keep moving. We pretty much skipped over gold when we talked in November. So we've got to talk about gold, especially after the price activity at the end of last year. So I would have thought with the gold price staying above two thousand pretty steadily, we would have seen more mainstream interest. I wonder if that is still to come, though. Is it, and what would be the catalyst? I think it is still to come. Uh, I think from the point of view of generalist investor, not industry investors that the performance of the so-called Magnificent Seven, the big tech stocks as such, that they, the generalist investor believes that those companies have enough pricing power that they themselves are inflation hedges. I, I mean, if you, where is this thing? If you look at the fact that Apple can sell me this little thing for $1,200 uh, and deliver enough utility to me that if they charge me 1400 I would still pay, Suggests, I think, to the big investors that there's plenty of pa- that there's plenty of pricing power in corporate America, and that they don't need to come down to the gold space. I think that's a mistake. Um, I, I think it's a big mistake. I think, with specific regards to Apple, although I'm not a, a tech investor, that their avenues for growth uh, are probably less dramatic than there were in the past. Their margins are insane, but I, I I think it's a wonderful company. But I think it's priced for perfection. I don't think perfection occurs. But let's leave that aside. In the gold space, uh, it is arguable that a U.S. investor, not a global investor, but a U.S. investor didn't need to own gold in the period 1982 to 2022. Declining real interest rates, globalization, the ability to export the U.S. fiscal problems by printing currency because we had the world's reserve currency meant that Americans didn't have to own gold. Everybody else did. Gold did well in other currencies, but not well in the U.S. dollar. I think that changed in 2022. I think, too, Charlotte, and most Americans don't understand this, only one half of 1% of total U.S. savings and investment assets are invested in precious metals-related assets. The four-decade mean is 2%. I believe that we're going to have reversion to mean. I'm not one of these guys who says that the U.S. Treasury market's going to collapse and gold's going to win the war against the U.S. dollar. Ridiculous. Reversion to mean. If you have reversion to mean... You quadruple demand for precious metals and precious metals-related securities in a market that is by itself 22% of the world's savings and investment capital market. That's what's going to happen. Okay. And you know, when it comes to interest in gold, especially in the West, I did want to mention, because I've seen so many headlines about it, the the Costco and Walmart and gold sales, does that tell us something about sentiment changing? It, it, it tells you that there is enough interest in Costco and Walmart that there's room for it on their shelf. What is a bit of interest to me, Charlotte, and you've been helpful in this. I have, in the last seven years, graded now 80,000 natural resource portfolios at Rural Investment Media. And what has occurred to me is that the interest in gold is much broader. It used to be when I was talking to a gold audience, I was looking at myself in the mirror. There were old, fat, bald, white guys right? That was the audience. In the last three years, my audience has become 35% non-Caucasian and 30% female. 
now when I'm talking to an interest of my own constituencies and I look at it at the audience, everybody's there. South Asian people are there. African people are there. Latin American people are there. Young women are there, which is important, separate and apart from the fact that they're pretty. Um, the democratization of the gold market is something that even the companies don't understand. They aren't gearing their investment pitches to the real gold market. They're gearing their pitches to the people that they used to sell to. And that's not where the market is anymore. Very interesting. And okay, just to go back to that 80,000 portfolios that you've looked at. So that gives us an idea of the demographics you're seeing in the shifts there. Are there any other trends in, in behavior that you would pick out? That's a wonderful question. Uh, the first and most obvious is that when I ask people individually to describe themselves as investors, uh, they almost uniformly decide, describe themselves as conservative investors, which is ridiculous. They're wild speculators. It, it's fine to be a wild speculator if you behave accordingly, if you understand and govern yourself uh, accordingly. It is also true, sadly, that people buy investment classes after they've proved themselves. And the way that they prove themselves is with an increase in price. So people tend to buy investments after they've already performed. After they've performed, they don't need to perform anymore. So as an example, when I would come on your show when uranium was at $20 and say the uranium price has to go up or the, or the lights are going to go out, nobody cared. Now that the price is already up to $100, above the incentive price, everybody wants to be in the uranium space. There is a, a sad tendency to worry about the, ha the horse after the horse is out of the barn. Uh, and people need to adjust their thinking in that regard. Okay. Well, hopefully people who are listening might, might keep that in mind. So let's, let's check in on uranium. We've got to go quickly through these topics. So really good performance in 2023 from uranium. You already told us that easy money has been made, but we've still got the real money and the big money. Last time we spoke, you said we're in that real money stage. We need to focus on companies doing real things. Is that still where we are? Absolutely. And at some point in time, if you'd like, you and I can have a real uranium discussion. There have been fundamental changes in the uranium market that are probably understood by 100 people. People are not paying attention. And it's important to pay attention to, but it's a 20-minute discussion. Uh, for myself, full disclosure... Uh, I was way early uranium, way, way, way long. Uh, I've now sold enough stock that I've recouped all my capital. I've sold enough to pay tax on the capital I recouped. And I sold a little more just to reward myself for being smart and early. Uh, so when I say that the big money's ahead, uh, that's not what I did. I de-risked the trade. Okay. And I want to touch on another comment from that conversation about uranium. So you made a comment about M&A, and you'd said companies like NextGen and Fission are likely to be taken over. So I want to hear a little bit more, hopefully, on how M&A activity could pan out for... Well, mercifully, we're starting to see it. Mercifully, we're starting to see at least lateral mergers uh, in among the uranium developers, which is important. Companies that have greater asset bases generally have lower general administrative charges relative to the assets under management. They're larger companies with more trading liquidity, uh, which means they have a lower cost of capital. What I suspect might happen is as the generalist money comes in the uranium space, the bigger companies will have larger market caps, more liquidity, and either the prices of the smaller ones go up or the big ones buy the small ones. That's what will happen. In the case of NextGen, you have a special circumstance. You have what is the best known undeveloped uranium deposit in the world. Uh, but... You have it, Canadians will hate me for saying this, but the, you have it 400 kilometers west of nowhere. Uh, there's no infrastructure there. And you have fission in the same place. So logically, those two deposits will be built as one. And the capital costs associated with building it uh, are likely to be such that the market won't trust the current next-gen management to build it. These guys were great explorers, like off the charts, good explorers. They've done a wonderful job in community relations. They've done everything right, but they're untested in terms of building $7 billion mines. So it is more likely than not, not certain, but more likely than not that somebody has to take them over. Logically, that would be Cameco, but Cameco just bought Westinghouse. Uh, they may be full. When you look at the whole range of acquirers, it is likely that because that's uranium and because it's in Canada, 
that the Canadian government will view it as a strategic asset. It's unlikely that China General Nuclear would be allowed to buy it, as an example. Uh, could tech buy it? Perhaps. Would the Canadian government allow BHP to buy it, now that BHP is spending $7 billion in Saskatchewan on a potash deposit? Maybe. But that's the kind of M&A that you have to look at. You have to look at strategic M&A. And I think we're going to see it in the space. And I think investors are going to make a lot of money out of it. Okay, very tricky, very much something to keep an eye on. But okay, still continuing on with uranium. So I keep hearing it's a seller's market. The producers are really in the driver's seat. And like many parts of the market, the deals that these companies do with utilities are pretty opaque. But I wondered if we could talk a little bit about them. And it, just in general, what should investors look for and what should they understand when they see companies stream? This is part of that longer conversation. Uh, what's important is that the physical market in uranium has gone from the spot market to the term market. This is important because it gives investors visibility as to uh, the top line, uh, the sales price, for a long time. And it gives you certainty. If you're signing an off-take agreement with a credit quality taker, Ontario Power, Duke Power, Southern Companies, uh, you have more certainty now in terms of revenue and price in the uranium business than in any other commodity on the planet. And that means that once you get the ability to understand with the existing disclosure, if you take the time to look at the structure of the company's contract book, you will be able over the next 10 years with uranium more than any other commodity on the planet, except perhaps iron ore, to have price certainty, which is really, really, really different. I've never seen anything like this in my years in the resource business. Okay, one more uranium question, and I, I'll hold you to that. We'll come back for a longer uranium question. So, price, you mentioned we've we've reached triple digits. We've gone beyond the incentive price. So, looking long-term, what's, what's a realistic long-term level? I don't know the answer to that. Partially, it's a function of interest rates. Uh, the incentive price has to do with the cost of capital put stuff into production. And it has to do with the levels of social rents. In other words, will, in very blunt terms, your prime minister decide to steal as much money from the uranium business as he does from the oil and gas business? Uh, because that would change the incentive price. Um, right now, I suspect that 75 US dollars at today's interest rate is plenty. What's important to know in the near term, Charlotte, and, and what, your, uh, what your audience needs to understand is that in the very near term, because of the long lead times required to increase production, uh, that the $100 incentive price won't in the near term increase production, except for the projects that Cameco and Kazatomprom have that were put on hiatus, about 15 million annual pounds. The deficit is about 50 million pounds. And we won't be able to address, address that deficit on a global basis for five to seven years, despite the increase in the spot price. Okay. And just because you mentioned Kazatom Prom, I know a lot of people are looking at their recent release where they said, okay, we're probably going to, or maybe not probably, they may fall short on their production 2024, 2025. Yep. Do, you, do you see that as significant or do we just not know yet? I do. Uh, I do think it's significant. It tells you a couple things. It says with regards to the, the material that they haven't returned to production at places like Gang Kai, that they're keeping their word. They told the investors that they wouldn't return that hot stopped production to production until they had sufficient long-term contracts that they were assured that their shareholders had reasonable returns on capital employed, which is to say that they're not paying attention to the $100 spot market. They're paying attention to how much production they can contract to China General Nuclear and other people. It also tells you that the faith that investors had, investors like me had, that they could restart their ISR projects easily was wrong. Uh, it turns out that when you restart an ISR project, although it's easier than an underground project, uh, it's very much like restarting a stopped uh, oil and gas water flood. There are reservoir characteristics that require customization. They will be successful. They are good at what they do. Uh, it will not be a no-brainer. Okay, all right. We'll leave uranium there for now, but I do hope that we'll come back to it at a later date. I have a fun question to finish things off, or at least I think it's fun. 
So uranium, we've been watching its move for a really long time. And I think now a lot of people are like, okay, it's here. What's what's the next uranium? So something that was... There's nothing as obvious okay. right now. But there are things that investors dislike because they've disappointed them. And that's where I'm looking. Uh, investors had high hopes for platinum and palladium. They were disappointed. They were disappointed partially because... The Russians have had to sell everything they possibly could to raise money. I saw this in 1991 and 1990. The last time the Russians were broke, they sold everything they had. What did they have? Potash, nickel, platinum, and palladium. So there's an artificial downturn in the platinum and palladium prices. The investors don't know why there's a dirt downturn. They just know there is. So they hate platinum and palladium. I love hate. So the fact that people are selling off platinum and palladium deposits outside of Russia and so outside of South Africa it means I'm a buyer. Uh, Letterite nickel production has increased a lot and the Russians are selling nickel. So the nickel price has collapsed. So everybody who was just hyper excited about nickel as a battery metal three years ago wishes they'd never learned to spell the word. Um, nothing's changed. The outlook in two years is radically different than the outlook today. So a high quality nickel deposit somewhere in the world is something I would look at. My favorite, although not for right now, is silver speculation. You remember the great silver squeeze. Uh, that whole generation of silver speculators got burned because they believed that they would prevail in three months. And they were wrong. They thought their time preference mattered to the market. It doesn't. Uh, silver is, from my viewpoint, the most volatile commodity among the precious metals. When silver moves, it moves further and faster. And I can get entry into high-quality junior silver stocks today uh, at prices that suggest that the silver price will never go up. Uh, a bet I'd love to take. As good as uranium was three years ago, no. But nothing is. Okay, thank you for going through those ones, all, all ideas that I think people should consider. Any final thoughts that you would leave investors with? For investors, not speculators, for investors, there's one final no-brainer market. That's the oil and gas business. Uh, the big thinkers in the world, you know, those morons that run your country and run mine, uh, would have you believe that peak oil demand will occur in 2030. And this is insane. As a group of people, we've now invested $5 trillion dollars trillion on alternative energies, and we've reduced the market share of fossil fuels from 82% all the way down to 81%. Peak oil demand occurs in 2065 or 2070. Meanwhile, the oil and gas industry is under investing a billion dollars a day in sustaining capital investments. For the next five years, the best sector in resources for investors, not speculators, is high quality oil and gas. If you have the courage for political risk, the mid-cap Canadian oil and gas companies, you know, Mr. Trudeau can't stay forever. Uh, and at some point in time, the Canadian political leadership will understand that if you have a whole world looking to buy Canadian natural gas, there is a business case for it. And while you wait for that blessed day to come, the Canadian natural gas producers are making a lot of money at today's prices, and they're paying astonishingly high dividends. Not for speculators, but for investors. This is the warmest and most comfortable place that you could possibly be. Okay, I think that's a great place to wrap it up. Thank you so much for coming on to share all your thoughts today. Always great to hear from you. Uh, finally, if I may, any of your listeners who care what I have to say about resources, can personalize it. Go to ruleinvestmentmedia.com, list your natural resource stocks. I'll personally rank them. I've done 80,000 times now in seven years. Uh, no cost, no obligation. If I have comments on individual issues that I think are of value, I'll comment. Once again, ruleinvestmentmedia.com. Uh, I will uh, rank the submitted natural resource stocks. Okay, sorry to cut you off. We'll add the information in the video description as we usually do. And yeah, we can become one of the 80,000. Very Great. good. Okay. Once again, I'm Charlotte McLeod with investingnews.com, and this is for Cruel. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, make sure you subscribe to our channel. We'd also love to hear your thoughts, so leave us a comment below. We'll see you next time.